Amen. We're going to continue from last week. Uh, our topic, culture driven for the glory of God. Uh, culture driven for the glory of God. I'd like to just add one word in there, and that is being culture driven for the glory of God. I think it kind of make a little bit more sense if we put it that way. But we're talking about culture, really, and that's really what this is all uh, have uh, all about. But before we open up, let us pray. Amen. Lord, right now, uh, settle our hearts, focus our mind on your word. And Father Lord, you do your best work in the preaching moment, in the time, Lord, that you minister to our hearts, individually and collectively. And so, Father Lord, we are still, we're here, and ready to receive your word. I pray, Father Lord, that you, Lord, will blot out all the distractions and father lord we would get comfortable in getting close to you today and so father lord we thank you now father lord use your preacher right now i need you lord give me power give me wisdom that i may direct this conversation to where it needs to go and then father lord that we will walk away and amazed at your presence and what you have said to us this morning and we would be uh, we will be moved Lord to um, impact the world that we live in and not just in coming out on Sundays but Father Lord living out your word every day of our lives so Father Lord we ask Lord that you would move upon this church your people we ask it in Jesus name amen so we're talking about <clears throat> culture driven for the glory of God last week <clears throat> we define culture right we define culture <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> in our definition of culture <clears throat> we defined it in a lot of words, really. And uh, I put some highlights there of some of the definitions of culture. Uh, and to be frank with you, whenever you try to define culture, it seems like you still are reaching for another way of seeing culture because it's just not adequate. None of the definitions are adequate in defining culture. But... I want to bring out what I think in simple terms, what culture seems to mean, right? And that is uh, the second bullet. It is the total way of life of a particular groups of people. It's a total way of life of a particular groups of people. But watch this. Here it is. Cult culture is the last bulletin. It is the personality of the group. It's the personality of the group. So who you are as a group is the culture of the group. So that's what really what it is. It's who you are. So, you know, when we start talking about being culture driven for the glory of God, really it comes down to who you are. As who you are. So I was thinking more about that. And I don't believe that last week I really kind of brought that out. But it's about who you are. You know, have you ever looked in your mirror and say, who am I? Who am I? So that's the thing is that we're looking in the mirror this Sunday to see who we are. You know, what, what we're, what, who we are. It, what is our way of life? You know, it, it includes everything that uh, a group of people think. How do we think? 
You know, how do you think individually when you bring it all together, it affects the group thinking culture? Because you are your own individual and you are bringing something to the group. And you may say, I don't have a lot to bring to the group. You thinking that you don't have a lot to bring to the group is bringing something to the group. <laughs> and so if you think about this, it's really overwhelming. You know, how you think, uh, what you say, what we say is part of our culture, what, right? What we do is part of our culture. What we even make, you know, our attitudes, our feelings, that's all imbibed in our culture. So, and, But another great thing about this and, and what we're seeing is that culture is learned it, and it is transmitted from generation to generation. It's learned and it's transmitted from generation to generation. And so think about that, right? And we got some mixed generations here, right? We got younger generation, we got older generation, right? And the older, think about the older generation, how you thought when you were growing up. And then you got the newer generation, how they think when they're growing up, right? They have new ideas, new ways, and, and things like that. And yet, we have to all, what, be one together, right? Amen. Amen? All right. So, so we, we try to define, hopefully that, that defined culture a little bit more. So, we said culture... When we say culture driven for the glory of God, what we mean is that we need to influence today's culture that will bring glory to God. That's what we mean. We need to influence today's culture that will bring glory to God. So last week we asked the question, how does culture affect Christians? Isn't that one of the questions we had? How does the culture affect Christians? We looked at two passages of scripture, and I'm going to be real quick on this because I want to get right to our answer, to, I mean, our question today. But we talked about Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 21. If you haven't read, read it, please read it. Read the entire chapter because it talks about, it's a good introduction to culture of what we're talking about, how culture affects Christians. Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 21. And when we uh, talked about it last week, we said we, we knew that Daniel in in that particular chapter, <clears throat> Daniel and a group of uh, individuals were taken as captives by King Nebuchadnezzar, by uh, the Babylonians. The Babylonians laid siege to Jerusalem and they seized Jerusalem for 75 years. This was a uh, this was uh, something that God was punishing Israel because they were going against his word. And so he allowed them to be captive to a foreign enemy. And so Nebuchadnezzar laid captivity upon Jerusalem and he chose choice men. See, he didn't just take the whole city and say, y'all going to come over here right now. No, he did it in stages. And the first stage was that he said, he told his princes, he said, look, I want, he told his chiefs rather, look, I want you to go and choose some wise men of Jerusalem. I want you to choose young men who are full of wisdom, who are quick to understand. <laughs> In other words, they understand uh, knowledge. They can, they, they have wisdom. They're just not, they, they're, they're people who love to learn. I want you to bring, see, those are the people that are, are the best of culture. Right? Because they are the ones that are the ones who are thinking ahead, right? When people are still in the past, right? They're in, they're in the future. They're thinking about what's going on, how things are moving. And so that's what happened. So Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, he, ex he instructed uh, one of his chief, Ashpenaz, uh, that you will go and choose these group of men and bring them, and we're going to train them for three years. We're going to train them for three years, and in those three years, I want you to give them my choices of meats, and I want you to give them the wine that I drink. So whatever I eat, whatever I drink, their diet would be the same. And so he, he did this, and so now notice, they're introduced to a new culture. Here was a culture that they knew about, but now 
this culture was basically put upon them, right? So they come there, and so, of course, the one of the biggest, biggest shocks was they, it, it, they changed their name. They changed their name. You think about it. Somebody come and change your name. They change your identity. Who you are. You looking in the mirror saying, I am this. I, this is me. This is my name. My mother named me, and I've always known to me to be this. And then somebody just one day and say, you're no longer that. Shocked them, right? So Daniel, <clears throat> he became this Belteshazzar. That was his, his, his foreign name, Belteshazzar. They, they didn't call him Daniel anymore. They called him Belteshazzar. And then uh, he had some other brothers who was with him, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Uh, Hananiah was called Shadrach. Uh, uh, Mishael was called Meshach. Azariah was called Abednego. So these are the Hebrew boys who were changed, right? Bear with me. Daniel, then in verse 8 of Daniel chapter 1, this is where the tide changed. Daniel then purposed in his heart. That's what the scripture says. Daniel purposed in his heart. He purposed in his heart that what? He would not defile himself with the portion of of the king's uh, meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs, he requested that he might not defile himself. Notice that. He wasn't rude or anything like that. He just said, look, I want to, you know, he, he approached him very nicely. But let me tell you how God is preparing you to impact the culture. Because in the next scripture, it says that God brought Daniel into favor and kindness to the chief of eunuchs. So in other words, he could approach a foreign chief about his situation. And I, I believe, and I think we can learn from that, but, but the point of it is, is that how did the culture affect Daniel? How did the, keep thinking about how the culture affected Daniel. So, and then of course, you know the story, after 10 days, <clears throat> basically Daniel made a proposal. Look, let us eat vegetables and water, drink water for 10 days. And then after 10 days, look, if we don't, if, 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 if we don't appear better than the others who are on the king's diet, then do what you will. He left it up to the chief to do it. And the chief said, okay, we'll do that. It was actually one of the stewards. And he said, we'll, we'll do that. We'll do it for 10 days. He said, as long as we're not going to go three years, we'll do it for 10 days. And so they did it for 10 days, and guess what? When they came and they looked at uh, the Hebrew boys, they were like, oh, okay. They do look better. They look much better. And so then guess what? They gave them exactly what? They then said, okay, you got your vegetables and water for three years. Notice, though, it started with a purpose, though, right? It started with a purpose. Uh, Daniel was not compromising. He did not compromise what God has already said that he should be doing, right? It started with Daniel not compromising. So, <clears throat> as we looked at that, then we went on to 1 Corinthians, right? We looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 19 through 22. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 19 through 22, Paul basically <laughs> was saying how he can affect the culture. He, he, he basically said, look, I will pers I, I pers to persuade the Jews of the gospel, to persuade them of the gospel truth, Paul said, I'll join them in observing the Old Testament requirements. You see? He placed himself then under the law so that he could, what, present the gospel to the Jews. Amen? But then he says, those without the law, he says, the Gentiles who, who didn't observe the Jewish law, those are the people who were out the law, to evangelize the Gentiles, Paul said he was willing to be without the law, but watch this, to adopt the custom and the culture of the Gentiles. However, this process did not include a disregard for God's law because Paul always remained under Christ's teachings. Y'all see that? Now remember how Daniel did it? Right? Daniel
Samuel didn't have a choice. Paul, under the dispensation of grace, after Christ died on the cross, rose from the dead, and he's now sitting in heaven. Under the dispensation, you see, now we have a choice. We have the freedom to what? Present the gospel to people who may not be under the teachings of Christ, but yet we are blessed to be able to introduce the teachings to impact the culture that we live in. Amen? Amen. All right. I went through all that. So from both of these passages, I get it. We see our culture is made of those who follow Christ's teachings and those who don't. Right? That's what we see here. Y'all see that? Those who follow Christ's teachings and those who don't. And you may be saying, <laughs> what is the difference between those two insects? Those, those are both insects, by the way. <clears throat> but if you remember, <laughs> this butterfly to the left here, I symbolize really for those who follow Christ's teachings. Because if you follow Christ's teachings, then that's going to be a transformation that takes place. You see, because the butterfly started out as a caterpillar. But then there was a process that took place. And in that proce process, there was a transformation taking place. Where he was created, not from what a, a, how he used to look, but what God wanted him to look like. And when he came out, he had wings that he could fly. When, as a caterpillar, he was always in the dirt, afraid of somebody stepping on him, trying to make it to the tree, ants chasing him. They wanted a meal for the day. He was trying to escape. He had his mind there, but God had a plan for him. All right, all right. He had a plan and a purpose that, let me tell you, I got something better for you. All right. And that's the butterfly. I love that. But then, we do in our culture have this thing right here. That is a beetle. But it's a dung beetle. It's a beetle that loves the waste, thrives on that which is dirty, that which is filthy. That's where they thrive. And let me tell you, I'm not, and I don't want y'all to walk away from here and say, well, you know what, if you don't have Christ, you're a dung beetle. <laughs> but I believe the picture allows you to see that what you can become in today's culture when we have a Daniel attitude Come on now. when we purpose it with our heart and when we have an impactful Paul objective that you know what <laughs> you're right <laughs> I don't know how you guys work, but you know what? I want to get to know you. I want to understand it. And I'm not going to walk into your world. Watch this. And what we do as Christians a lot of times is that we go into other people's world with this I know it all attitude. All right. All right. When we have that type of attitude, they're looking at us as if, you know what? You, you seem like you too, be, too good for me or, you, you, you know, you better than everybody else. This is why Paul says, no, I'll go without the law. I'll put my tunic down. I'll, I'll go in my jeans, right? I'll put my T-shirt on and I'll hang out with you all to understand exactly what it is to talk to you on your language, you know, in your language, and how you do that. I wonder if how many of us actually kind of do that. Will we go out our way in doing that? 
there's something that we're learning here. So from both of these, so we see culture is, in, in today's culture, we have those who follow Christ and those who don't, right? So here's the question. So what are some of, what are some of the causes, really? What are some of the causes of why Christians are conforming to non-Christian culture? And that's what we want to answer today. What are the causes of why Christians are conforming to the non-Christian culture? And we got 10 minutes to do it. <laughs> Amen. That's the question. What are the causes of why Christians are conforming to the non-Christian culture? It's amazing, and I want to open this up, and again, we're going to uh, go around the room here, but uh, I want you to please feel free to jump in, and don't worry about the time. I'll, I'll, I'll take care of the time. What, what are the causes of why Christians are conforming to the non-Christian culture? Scared. Mm. Tell me more about that. Could you repeat that in the microphone? Yeah, uh, being scared and not uh, being able to tell people that they're Christians. Mm. So fear. Fear. You want to go? You scared to go against the grain? Yeah, you scared to go against the grain, right? Yeah. So acceptance by others. You you yeah. want to be accepted by others? Mm -hmm. Really? Right? Right. That you, that's that's really what it comes down to. Fear a lot of times drive our decisions and we let fear take control right and when it comes down to it it's about I want to be accepted by other people because you're afraid of what people will say about you that's what it is you want to be accepted but you're afraid about what they're gonna to say to you you can't be you you can't be the monarch the butterfly you, 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 you're afraid to be the butterfly. Yep. All right. Anybody else? I like that. Fear. What else? Let, let's, let's keep going. What else? Not wanting to be totally committed. Not wanting to be totally committed. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not wanting to give up maybe some yeah. worldly things that are pleasing to the flesh. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it's like, yeah, I like Christian culture, but I'm not willing and ready to give up some of the other things that I really, really like. So yeah. I'll just kind of, you know, yeah, have one foot in the door and one foot out. Oh, oh, my gosh. That's, you know, that's not wanting to live the life that you're supposed to live. Not wanting to live the life that you're supposed to live. Daniel wanted to live the life that God created him to be. That's why he purposed it in his heart. Not wanting to live the life you're supposed to be. So what is the life you're supposed to live? What is the life you're supposed to live? Like, in, like the first slide. Uh-huh. To follow Christ's teaching. Yes. Okay. And, and so, how, how do we know what Christ's teachings are? <laughs> we got to be taught. We got to get in the Word. Yeah. Now, give her the mic if she's going to say it. Yeah. No, I mean, she's right. Uh, Hold the mic. And get, yeah. along, uh, get, uh, get around surrounding people who, who have like-minded ideas in, in you and just get stay away from the negativity. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, watch this. Uh oh. Don't mean to. Don't mean. No, no. Keep the mic. Cause I don't. I don't want. Uh, I, I. I may muddy the water a little bit about what you just said. All right. Being around. We we say that a lot. Let's be around like-minded people. But if you don't know who you are, who you around. If they're like-minded like you. Y'all follow me? Mm -hmm. If you don't know who you are, if you're not the butterfly, 
and you don't know that God, you're still a worm. You still crawling on the dirt in the dirt. You haven't been transformed. But you're comfortable going around people who think like you. That's what you're saying. Like-minded is like someone who think about me. Can I can I challenge you a little? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, you yeah. get around people who you want to be like. Because when the caterpillar saw the butterfly Okay. I want to be like the butterfly. Right, I'm right, tired of right. hitting this dirt every day. And let me tell you, that journey, it's a process. But God will send the people that you need to be around. But culture is around us everywhere we go. And so to be like-minded... It's difficult to find people who are further ahead of us. You got to have your antennas open. You have to know what you're looking for. Amen. I mean, you got to be committed also to living the life you're supposed to live. You see, a lot of us don't want to live the life that we're supposed to live. God created us to live a life. Let's go to Romans. Go to Romans chapter 12. Oh, this is good. This is good. Look at Romans chapter 12. Oh, my. Verse 1 to 3, and, I, and I'll, I'll read it. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your what? Reasonable service. And do not, watch this, do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may what? Prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. In other words, be the butterfly. That's who you are. Be committed to living the life that you're supposed to live. I get happy about that. But then, you know, we talked about fear. And, and, you know, Daniel, he confronted fear, didn't he? Don't know the word of God. Oh, that, that was, that's a good one. But that's, you know, oh, I'm sorry, acceptance by others. I'm sorry. Um, which is uh, fear, right? When, when you're, you want to be accepted by others. Uh, Proverbs 19 uh, and 25, and I'll turn there real quick. In Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 25. I'm talking about 29 and 25. I was like, that doesn't look right. 29 and 25. And it reads, the fear of man brings a snare. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. We need to get rid of fear, y'all. We need to get rid of fear. There's too much fear going on. We, we keep wanting to please other people. When you try to please other people, that's what's driving your fear. Because you want to be accepted by them. Daniel didn't do that, did he? You see, we need to understand that. And then also, what, what are some of the other uh, causes of why Christians are conforming to the non-Christian culture? It doesn't, and and just, just say what's on your mind. You don't have to read what's up there. I was going to say, because yes. you don't want to be, I don't want to say, I want to say like the spotlight. If I say I'm a Christian, then you're going to expect me to act like a Christian. So I don't want to be put on front street. That's mm. awesome. Yeah, yeah. Again, <clears throat> committed. I don't want to be co committed or even disciplined, right? Living a disciplined life or accountable, right? To who I am, right? And, and I was thinking, I don't know, if I, it's a little of everything, but I think mm -hmm. because to, to be... 
I guess to be in it and to share, like in the way Paul was going, you know, he didn't stay away from those people because he wanted to share the word with those people. But to be uh, in the life that Christ wants us to leave, you have to be intentional. Yeah. Because the culture makes it easy to, oh, I don't feel like going, or, yeah, they said let's do this, but I don't feel like it. And culturally, you're fine doing that. So it you have to be intentional mm-hmm. with, uh, I guess, like you were saying, your commitment to, you know, to living what you say you feel about Christ. Yeah. It, 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 it can't just be... Yeah, I know I said that, but I don't feel like doing that today, so. Yeah. Right. So a, a, a lot of the reasons why uh, we're conforming to the non-Christian culture is because we're not intentional. Yeah, about and it's living, acceptable. Yes, <laughs> if you, the nobody, Christian life. Nobody, you know, if you say you didn't go to church yesterday, nobody goes, what? You didn't go to, nobody says yeah, that. Nobody says and that. if you're not studying the Bible, <laughs> yeah. nobody says you didn't read your, I mean, nobody, it's acceptable. Yeah, it's acceptable. So you, you have to be intentional to do it. Amen. Amen. And, and so that is so important because <clears throat> to to call people out in accountability is countercultural almost, isn't it? Yeah. It, it's countercultural. However, <clears throat> it's okay when it's on your job. Mm. Am I am I making this up? It's okay when it's on the job. Because there is an expectation. An expectation of you being involved somehow in that work culture. Right? Oh, I love what Sister Jackie is saying here because... I'm intentional in making sure that I go to my job and I do my job because I know that I have someone to report to. And at the end of the week, I'm going to get a paycheck. Amen? What keeps me in that culture is the paycheck. doesn't feel good at times, but I go through it because I know there's a payday at the end. Culture driven for the glory of God. How is that right now associated with the Christian and the Christian point of view and the Christian life? Is that because we're not intentional (laughs) in going and serving for the Lord. And we then conform to anything that the world gives us. Wow, that's powerful. You know, Pastor, uh, what all that's saying is that we as people are not making God our priority. I see that's the third one. That's very important. Like... Our time is more important than God. Our paycheck is more important than God. He's the one who yeah. gives it to us. Yeah. Now, Amen. I'm saying this because it, I, I've been hit hard. I know when when I don't tithe, I'm like, uh-uh, I got to give my 10% because I'm not, I wouldn't make him my priority. And it affected me personally. Yeah. And so that's where I, I, uh, I agree with what you're saying. Everything that you're saying, it, uh, even with Sister Belvis, and at the end of the day, we're not making God a priority. Priority. Amen. God is not a priority. Because yeah. uh, all of them, uh, the ones you named out, it's because we're not making God a priority. Yeah, yeah. But seek, but, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Amen. So, so you see, you see, God must be a priority, but, but the reason why we're conforming to the non-Christian culture is that God is not a priority. And I don't have the time to go through all the, I hope y'all are writing these scriptures down. But then we, we, we see 
we, we don't want to be held accountable. And I do want to read this one here before we go. And that is um, <clears throat> Romans chapter 14, verse 12. Romans chapter 14. And, and we're going to end it here. Because I think you all have hit every one of them. But don't know the word of God, right? We, well, let me, let me start with Romans uh, chapter 14. So in Romans chapter 14, uh, verse 12. Okay. It reads, So then, each of us shall give an account of himself to who? God. <laughs> each of us shall give an account of himself to God. We don't want to be held accountable to no one, even to God. Can, can I say this? It's not, a, it's not a choice. It's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, it's a mandate. We will be held accountable to God. Amen? But God has also sent people in your life. To help you, encourage you on this Christian journey. Amen? Amen. Go to uh, Gal Galatians chapter 6. <clears throat> In Galatians chapter 6. Verses, um, what does it say? One, one through five. Okay, thank you. It says, brethren... In Galatians chapter 6, brother, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are what? Spiritual, restore such a one in a what? Spirit of gentleness, consider yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let one, let each one examine his own work, and then he will res what have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For each one shall what bear his own load. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you, restoring you when you fall is part of the fellowship of the members of in Jesus Christ. You see, this is talking about accountability. This is talking about accountability. You're not in this alone. Just as we, and, 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 and another script, and, and I'm not, I don't have time to do this, but if you read James 5 and 16, you'll see that you need to confess your sins one to another, your faults, right? One to another. Notice that. Y'all see that? You say, wait a minute, I thought I just confessed that to God. Now, this is not saying you go on Facebook and confess everything that you've done. That's not what that's saying. No. That is talking about in the what? In the circle, in the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Boy, I wish I had more time. The causes of why Christians are conforming to the non-Christian culture really comes down to those five. You don't know the word of God. 2 Timothy 2 and 15, you need to study to show yourself approved. A lot of us, there's a lot of babes, right, in Christ. And they need to grow in God's word. They don't know the word of God. I put Daniel 1 right there because why? Because Daniel, he knew the word of God. He knew God's law about his diet. Amen. And accepted by others. God is not a priority. Don't be held accountable. Don't want to be held accountable. And not wanting to live a life that you're supposed to live. Amen. Amen. Let us in a, in a word of prayer. Amen. We're dismissing now. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you. Because Lord, you have given us a culture. Now Father Lord, let us be impactful. Let us go out, Lord, and, oh, Father, Lord, glorify you in the culture you have given us. Be with us, Father, Lord. I pray that we, Lord, as we thought about all of these things, that, Lord, we just didn't just...
think about it and forget it, but Lord, that we would take this and meditate upon it, meditate upon the scriptures, that you would do the transforming, that we would be the butterfly, we would be the monarch and not the beetle. Father, I ask, Lord, for transforming power, that you would transform our lives right now. I ask it in the magnificent name of Jesus. Be glorified. Amen.